Next up, we have Anavar Saka, who's going to be telling us about uh, designing DNA with tunable regular pre-activity. Hello. I'm Anirban. Uh, I'm, from, I'm a postdoc from uh, Peter Kuz's lab uh, at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. I'm going to present uh, the paper titled Designing DNA with Tunable Regulatory Activity Using Discrete Diffusion. This is a joint work with Amber, uh, Chris, and Peter. Transcriptional regulation requires the complex coordination of many proteins. Uh, this simplified diagram shows proteins interacting with DNA at cis regulatory elements, also referred to as CREs, such as enhancers and promoters. And within a CRE, short sequence elements called motifs coordinate the, the binding of transcription factors to regulate gene expression. The rules governing this coordination are known as the cis regulatory uh, um, code. Decoding this complex language of the regulatory genome, that is the cis regulatory code, uh, is a major goal in genomics. And understanding the regulatory code is crucial for many downstream applications including designing synthetic sequences uh, with desirable properties. Supervised models have become uh, the standard for regulatory genomic sequence analysis. High-performing supervised models can be used to design DNA sequences by treating them as a scoring function. In this way, uh, designing sequences uh, is reframed as a sampling problem. There have been a few approaches that have been proposed to sample uh, local sequence space based on uh, in silico evolution, gradient ascent, and simulated annealing. By contrast, generative modeling of DNA sequences offers the chance to globally sample sequence space, but it, it is still in its uh, infancy. There have, been many, uh, there have been attempts such as GANs, deep exploration networks, and uh, more recently with DNA language model. Generative modeling for regulatory DNA sequences is quite challenging. So while VAs, GANs, and LLMs work so well for protein sequences, they often struggle with uh, regulatory uh, genomics. That's because regulatory sequences are characterized by high variability in their positions, their lengths, and compositions. Evolutionary constraints are not imposed at the sequence level, but rather at the functional level. Uh, diverse arrangements of strong and weak motifs can produce the same functional outcome which means that regulatory DNA can drift quite a bit, so they are quite diverged across species. Second, the challenges of modeling non-coding DNA are further compounded by a significant class imbalance. Uh, important regulatory sites are relatively sparse and scattered among seemingly random nucleotides. So when uh, training generative models using reconstruction-based losses or even language modeling objectives, this extreme class imbalance of information means that the model is tasked with predicting uninformative nucleotides at most positions, which can only occur by definition by uh, memorization. Third, the relationship between DNA sequence and cellular behavior is highly complex. While every cell in a multicellular organism shares the same DNA, cell types uh, exhibit widely varying behaviors due to differential uh, regulation encoded in the genome. And this encoding is complex and activated based on uh, spatiotemporal cues. So generative models that focus solely on DNA for their training are unlikely to capture the full complexity of cell type specific cis regulatory codes in regulatory DNA. Recently, uh, diffusion models have emerged as a promising approach for generative modeling of DNA sequences. Uh, these approaches uh, span standard denoising diffusion probabilistic models, latent diffusion, to modify diffusion models that better accommodate the, the categorical nature of uh, DNA sequences. And the latest work in this direction is Dirichlet flow matching. However, the evaluation of these models have been on the lighter side, leaving open questions of whether these models are a significant advance in the generative modeling of uh, regulatory DNA. In a standard diffusion model, there are two processes, a forward process that adds noise uh, to an input sample and a reverse process that serves to denoise the data and generate a new sample. In denoising diffusion probabilistic models, the noise is given by an isotropic Gaussian distribution. In each step, the, uh, 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 a small uh, amount of Gaussian noise is added to the image, ultimately leading to pure random noise. The reverse diffusion process aims to learn how to denoise the data, and uh, the typical architectures are based on uh, variational autoencoders. 
Score matching is an alternative formulation where the goal is to use a neural network uh, we call S theta to approximate the score, uh, which is the gradient of the log probability density function. Adding, add, uh, adding some tricks to this uh, enable uh, getting around the pesky uh, normalization constant of uh, probability distributions, which is typically intractable to calculate. Intuitively, score matching is the vector field that points to the higher density region. Score matching can be formulated in a similar manner to diffusion where Gaussian noise is added and there is a denoising process that uses the trained neural network, S theta. Score matching has been shown to work really well for con continuous data like images. Recently, score matching has been extended to discrete data by using concrete score. For a data point X in discrete space and another neighboring point Y, the density ratios QY over QX are collectively known as the concrete score, which also can directly be modeled by a neural network. Uh, again, we name it S theta, <laughs> similar. This has been shown to work well for text data, and so we thought it would be suitable to explore for DNA sequences. I'm going to skip, uh, skip over the details of this, as uh, it is quite technical. But you can find me to chat about them throughout the conference if you are interested. To assess uh, the, quant uh, the, the quality of the generated, generated sequences, we come up with a wide variety of in silico evolu evolutions. For functional similarity, we want to assess whether the generated synthetic sequences exhibit the same, gener uh, same distribution of functional activity as natural uh, genomic sequences. Conditional generation fidelity uses a supervised oracle to provide functional levels for uh, synthetic sequences and matched genomic sequences, and then calculate the mean squared error. We match sequences by using the functional activity of the genomic sequences as a conditional value uh, for the generated sequences. The Frechet distance is similar, uh, but instead of predictions, it measures the distance of the distribution of uh, penultimate representations from a supervised oracle, assuming a multivariate Gaussian distribution. Another way to calculate functional similarity is through the predictive distribution shift, which measures the largest gap in the cumulative distribution function of functional levels given by a supervised uh, oracle for matched genomic and synthetic sequences. This is essentially the kolmogorov smirnov test statistic. For sequence similarity, we use the percent identity, which measures the extent of uh, memorization as well as the diversity of the synthetic sequences. But since percent identity alone isn't useful for regulatory sequences, we also consider the KMR spectrum shift, uh, which is the jensen shannon distance between the KMR distributions. And discriminability assesses how well a supervised model can distinguish between synthetic and genomic sequences. This method is analogous to a GAN uh, discriminator, but applied in a post hoc manner. Ideally, we would like to see low percent identity and low KMR uh, spectrum shift, which indicates similar uh, KMRs within the regulatory DNA, but not through explicit memorization. Also, we want the discriminat uh, discriminatability to have an AURC of 0 0.5, which means that the synthetic DNA sequences are similar to the genomic sequences. Uh, compositional similarity aims to evaluate whether synthetic uh, sequences contain key elements of regulatory DNA, particularly motifs and their grammars. First, we conduct a standard motif enrichment, enrichment analysis using a database of known motifs, and uh, we also examine their co-occurrences. We also analyze functional motifs, uh, indicate, uh, identify it through attribution analysis, such as gradient shape. Uh, that allows us to assess the composition of functional motifs that might not be present in existing databases. Furthermore, we also deployed an attribution consistency metric to quantify the consistency of patterns within a population of attribution maps. We benchmark D3 using an established dataset for diffusion models, which is based on the conditional generation of human promoter sequences. The conditioning is based on case data and experimental technique that measures uh, transcription start site activity, which serves as a proxy for expression levels. Here, the sequences are 1KB long, and the KSIC track is also 1KB long. In this benchmark, previous diffusion models have been evaluated using conditional generation fidelity. Uh, the, the original study uh, was, uh, was Dirichlet diffusion score matching, in short DDSM, uh, by the Zhou lab, and they incorporated other approaches, including bit diffusion and D3PM. 
More recently, DDHLA flow matching improved upon DDSM. Here, we further expanded the benchmark using D3 models, uh, using CNN used by previous methods, and a transformer to see if we could do even better by using a more expressive model. Our results demonstrate that D3 with transformers produces sequences that are not only diverse, but also functionally similar to natural promoters with a lower MSE and a similar predictive distribution shift. These synthetic sequences also exhibit motif distributions that closely resemble those found in natural promoters, but the sequences are not being memorized. This suggests that D3 effectively captures the complex patterns and functional characteristics of human promoters, at least through the lens of the supervised oracle. Next, we benchmarked the diffusion models using a fly in answer dataset, which is based on the StarSeq assay from the Stark Lab. It consists of 249 nucleotide long sequences, each associated with two scalar enhancer activity uh, uh, values corresponding to a developmental promoter and a housekeeping promoter. We trained both our D3 model and the DHLA flow matching, uh, in short DFM uh, model, using the same two base architectures, a CNN and a transformer. In our approach, we simultaneously conditioned the models on both activity values. Our, um, our uh, evaluation on the fly in, uh, enhancer data set yielded consistent values, uh, consistent results with our previous findings. D3 generated uh, sequences exhibited a higher efficacy in their function. They exhibited the same composition as natural sequences and even a downstream discriminative model uh, could not tell them apart as, the, as indicated by an AURC close to 0.5 in the discriminability test. Together, this reinforces the, uh, the effectiveness of D3 in capturing and generating regulatory genomic sequences. Next, we investigated whether the synthetic sequences uh, provide additional information that can benefit a supervised DNN as a data augmentation. To test this, we systematically reduced the size of Deepstar training set and then added synthetic sequences generated by different diffusion models. The results were uh, encouraging. Uh, even when uh, using the full training set, adding synthetic sequences from D3 uh, improved the performance of a freshly trained Deepstar model. This suggests that D3 synthetic sequences provide greater genetic variability while still encoding meaningful cis regulatory information. Moreover, the benefits of uh, augmentation with the D3 generated synthetic sequences were even more pronounced in the small training data regime. Next, uh, we investigated the model's potential to generate sequences with task-specific activity levels. We tested their ability to generate sequences with predetermined activity levels for two different tasks, developmental and housekeeping promoters. We looked at different cases uh, with same activity levels and high activity uh, in one task and low in the other. The results show that our D3 TRAN uh, uh, excels are generating sequences that closely match the intended activity levels, uh, irrespective of whether the activities are similar or different between tasks. This indicates that D3 has uh, captured meaningful biological patterns and can apply them to create synthetic sequences with desired properties. Uh, in this study, we extended score entropy discrete diffusion to DNA sequences and performed extended evaluations of the generated uh, sequences. However, many of our evaluations rely on in silico oracles to provide levels of generated sequences. This uh, just evaluates how well the generative models align with the supervised oracles. So if generative models learn cis-regulatory codes that are better than supervised uh, oracles, this cannot be properly assessed. Also, we are largely interpreting the cis-regulatory codes from synthetic sequences uh, through either existing bioinformatics tools or attribution analysis using a supervised oracle. If the generative model is learning better or more expansive cis-regulatory codes, we cannot assess this. Another limitation is that biology often lives in a small data regime, and it's unclear to what extent diffusion models can work well in such regimes. Uh, we are actively exploring this as well. Moving forward, uh, we have several open questions. What benefits, if any, uh, will, diffusion, uh, will, will generative models for DNA provide over uh, the more prevalent supervised models uh, that have already been proven to be quite useful? What uh, new applications can generative DNA models uh, help accelerate? 
Uh, we don't necessarily have good answers for these open questions yet, so if anyone in the audience has any good uh, ideas, I would love to hear what you think. I would like to thank everyone in the lab uh, for short and long technical and non-technical discussions at some point uh, that improved my understanding on diverse topics. A special thanks to uh, Amber and Chris for their great help uh, in this project. Finally, I, I thank Peter uh, for constant support, guidance, and encouraging uh, encouragement during uh, my time at the lab. Uh, my fellow postdoc, uh, Jessica, will present a spotlight talk on genomic uh, deep learning with knowledge distillation this afternoon with poster number six uh, and ID60, I guess. Uh, please check them out, uh, uh, check that out uh, if, if you like. Yeah, thank you. All right, and we have time for a few questions. Could you expand on how you measure memorization? Okay. Actually, we calculated, uh, I mean, we, we actually measured memorization through percent identity. And we, uh, this, this is basically a uh, dot product between the generator sequences and the true sequences. And uh, the, while this is not a uh, very good uh, 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 representation of like quality measurement of the generator sequences, but this is uh, something. Uh, Uh, if you share something by one nucleotide, would that be captured? Uh, come again, please. I'm if sorry. I shift the sequence by one nucleotide, would it be captured in this metric? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, it should be captured. I mean, uh, the I mean, so it captures. I mean, uh, so it 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 doesn't have the biological insight. Uh, I mean, this particular uh, measurement doesn't have the biological insight. Like what? should be, more, I mean, what is actually changed compared to the uh, uh, true sequence, but this actually captures even one uh, nuclear age change. Sorry, I meant if I shift the whole thing, like yeah. is your metric alignment based or is it dot more accurately described as a product based? It is pr product based, yeah. Uh, I guess my question was going to be um, how much have you compared to the other way of doing the generation, which would be the more NLP way with uh, autoregressive models, and do you see those being competitive with diffusion? Yeah, so actually uh, this particular method uh, was uh, applied for, uh, or shown, in, uh, shown uh, to give good results for text, and this particular, I mean, so for text, this particular method was compared with GPT-2. So I would say uh, diffusion-based models are still uh, lagging behind compared to the, the DNA language models. But uh, this is a different uh, way to understand the uh, sequences and generate uh, new sequences. So um, I mean, people are working on that. And recently, uh, people started working with uh, flow matching. Uh, and, and I would, I mean, personally, I would be very interested to like see what is coming up, yeah. Uh, thanks for the talk, uh, very interesting. I had a question regarding uh, whether you tried, I guess you tried this for conditional generation too, right? Yes. Like, so I'm trying to understand when this kind of approach goes uh, out of distribution without like being easy to detect. So often if you, if you ask the, these kinds of models to generate sequences that are simply impossible, right? Like <clears throat> very, very high activity that's like effectively not possible at all or not, not at least in distribution in the data you trained. Um, have you noticed that these models also do that? And if so, is there an easy way to detect uh, when they go out of distribution? Because that is, I think, more important. It's not that like, everything will go out of distribution at some point, but is, it, is there an easy way to detect if that happens? Uh, thank you for the question. This is, this is a really interesting uh, question. And um, actually, we uh, tried to see uh, with very high uh, activity levels, uh, I mean, and, and tried to see the quality of the generator sequences. Um, but probably the generator sequences uh, are, I mean, they have like some motifs. They have like uh, like too many occurrences of very important motifs, which might not, uh, which might not represent uh, the the. I mean, original sequences. So that kind of stuff uh, we kind of noticed. Uh, but we, I mean, uh, we actually tried to uh, understand, like, by removing some motifs and all, like, how they interact and what actually matters to give you that uh, kind of high activity. So, but but this is this is something uh, 
we also want want to uh, explore. Yeah, thank you. Great. Let's thank Anibar again. Thank you.